Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. We range from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor of the Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Damon Linker of The Week, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. Our special guest this week is Noah Smith, who writes a column on Substack called No Opinion. He's a former professor of finance and writes knowledgeably about economic matters, but not only those. I would like to choose for our text this week a piece that appeared in the New York Times by Thomas Edsel, who has also been a guest on this podcast. It was titled, Democrats Shouldn't Just Panic, they should go into shock. And what he was referring to is a series of polls and other indicators that suggest that the Democratic Party is about to get shellacked in the midterm elections of 2022. Uh, Let me give you just one or two examples. Of course, it is common for the president's party to lose seats in off-year elections, but according to a poll from ABC News, the current polling of registered voters shows a 10-point Republican advantage, which Gary Langer of ABC says is the largest advantage for the Republicans since 1981. So let's start with you, Linda Chavez. Do you think that the Democrats should be in a complete panic about this? And if so, what should they do? Well, I I think they should. What should they do? I'm not sure how to advise them because I have very mixed feelings as listeners to this podcast know about this phenomena. So, I mean, generically, but for the fact that Donald Trump controls the Republican Party, if if I were being a, a voter called and asked who I thought could best handle the economy, I think that traditional Republican economic policies have benefited the country. I agree broadly with the Republicans on things like tax cuts and restraints on government spending. What's frightening about these polls, though, is that they are not occurring in a vacuum. We are not in 1981. Ronald Reagan is not the uh, standard bearer of the Republican Party. Uh, You don't have uh, the kind of Republicans that were in Congress at the time in Congress now. And so I I think they should be in a full-blown panic what they can do about it is, however, I think very much open to debate. I mean, I think they're pushing ahead with this large spending bill at a time when we've got inflation, when it's not absolutely clear that the kinds of proposals that are included in that won't have some deleterious effect in terms of of inflation. But the point is that the Democrats uh, just do not seem to be able to strike a chord with the American population. It, you know, they were able to win, I think, largely because of Donald Trump, because Donald Trump was president and was running for re-election. And even though he has enormous influence right now, and there's a lot of Trumpist elements in the party, I think people are less worried about that right now and are more worried about their economic future. And they don't like what they see from the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Noah Smith, voters don't always vote on ideology. In fact, they rarely do, or few voters do, let's put it that way. Though polls do show that a majority of Americans believe that the Democratic Party has moved too far to the left. But I want to run past you a a slightly different analysis of what's happening here with Biden's sinking popularity. A part of it is that that he's out of step with what the voters' concerns are. But it seems that there's a beta male thing going on, that Biden was chosen because he was seen to be a competent leader, a calm, sane leader who knew all the levers to pull. He had been in Washington for decades. And as the first year of his presidency has unfurled, instead we have seen an image of ineffectuality and sometimes downright incompetence. So, of course, the withdrawal from Afghanistan was broadly perceived to have been shambolic. The return of the virus uh, after it was declared pretty much defeated 
And then his inability to lead his own troops on the hill and get what he wants. Instead, it seems that he is having to pay obeisance to the progressives and that he's being controlled rather than the leader. And so his stature as a leader just seems to have been damaged in all by all of those things. What, what do you make of that? Well, you know, I'm not a um, political expert or professional political analyst here. So take what I say with a grain of salt. But I think that the basic thing here is that Biden, you know, he's old, but even when he wasn't old, he was somewhat of a mild hands-off kind of guy. And what happened with the Biden administration is he brought in a whole bunch of very determined and dynamic, smart, progressive people who had been sort of saving up all these good ideas over the last 10 years and waiting for the chance to get into an administration and implement them. And when he got into power, he basically took all those young progressive people and said, go do your thing. At first, it worked really, really well. COVID relief was highly effective. Uh, The vaccine rollout was highly effective. Yes, there were the anti-vaxxers, but among everyone who wasn't an anti-vaxxer, it was very effective. Vaccine mandates were effective. And and they started doing a bunch of other low-key effective stuff that people have been planning for a while. The problem is that circumstances changed. Well, okay, so Afghanistan was not circumstances. That was Biden simply choosing to get out. I don't think that was as mismanaged as people think. If it had looked like our withdrawal in Vietnam, where we actually lost a war, you know, we would have had a lot of Americans killed by the Taliban. Instead, the only Americans killed, I think, were killed by a random ISIS attack. Of course, ISIS is fighting against the Taliban. And so we essentially just made a deal with the Taliban to hand over the country back to them. And that was going to happen anyway. Trump just delayed it because he didn't want to look bad. And now Biden's like, let's get this over with. The Taliban owns this country. We're going to give it back to them. And we did it without losing a bunch of our our guys. You know, that's better than people think and more inevitable than people think. But on COVID, you know, the Delta variant, they really dropped the ball by not going more aggressive with booster shots and by not having a national strategy toward, uh, you know, when do we get to end mask mandates and what do we do with kids in schools and things like that. They really, there was a failure of leadership there. And I think Delta was this thing that they didn't really plan for because they didn't have strong leadership, there was no sort of pre-existing plan to deal with that. And so there wasn't much to do. Inflation was another thing. No one expected inflation. We hadn't had inflation since the early 80s. You know, we thought we had conquered it. And it was this sort of like this mythical dark force. Oh, it's banished. It's dead. And then the plot of the fantasy novel is always, oh, no, it, it was always waiting to come back. And then we didn't really know what to do with that. Now you see the Biden administration really floundering and flailing around and thinking, okay, so, so at first they tried to say, all right, our infrastructure investment will reduce inflation. Well, that's complete bullshit, you know, because those, in, of course, better capacity makes us more resilient to inflationary shocks. Sure. 10 years from now, right. it's not going to do a dang thing over the next couple of years. And so that was just absolute rubbish, just some crap that they threw up there because they didn't know what to do. Now they're flirting with the idea that companies being greedy and hoarding and speculating in commodities is what's actually causing inflation, which is also complete and utter bullshit. That's the kind of dangerous thing that you see governments that don't want to deal with inflation sort of turn to right before inflation sort of spirals out of control and gets really bad in countries like Venezuela. And so that's really worrying me. That incipient attempts to blame inflation on corporate power is absolutely, that's terrifying because that could mean inflation would go from five, seven percent or whatever it is now to like 20 percent higher, 70s like or worse, that could actually just at that point we're looking at major national calamity. And so that's really scary. And so I think what happened is that the Biden administration had this brittle approach of delegating policy to a whole bunch of younger people who were smart, who knew their areas really well, and who had lots of good plans ready and prepared to go. And circumstances just kind of intervened. And it wasn't the kind of administration that was set up to pivot when circumstances intervened. Damon, was it this lack of flexibility, or do you think there was something else at work? Do you think it was that the uh, voters had voted for moderation and instead they were getting progressivism that they didn't vote for? What do you think? Well, I do think that there's some of that, not among Democrats. If you look at the polling a little bit more at a granular level, you see that a good portion of 
Biden's collapse over the last three months has been a, a function of losing independence. And they're sort of like members of both parties, but in you know, all but name. So there are some independents who almost always vote for Democrats while refusing to call themselves Democrats and other independents who nearly always vote for Republicans without calling themselves that. But there are categories of independents who are persuadable, who do switch parties from election to election. And it appears that a good portion of those who were persuadable either way in 2020 went for Biden because they didn't personally like Trump. They were scared of him, thought he was incompetent and wanted him out. Those people are the ones, I think, who, beginning with the Afghanistan mess, and now I will say I agree with Noah that it could have been much worse and it wasn't that bad. It could have been much worse. I do think that even by that standard, it clearly didn't look good, and not just because the media really kind of hammered the bad images that came up in mid-August, but simply the fact that Biden and everyone around him, including all of the military officers who show up on cable news all the time, were constantly talking about, well, you know, the, the Taliban might take over in six or eight months, and what ended up happening is it didn't even take us withdrawing for the country to collapse, the government that we propped up for all of these years, the military we trained to fall to pieces. All of that happened while we were still in the country and led to two weeks of chaos where we looked like we were kind of running for the exits as quickly as possible while the place was burning down. That gives a feeling of kind of a lack of wherewithal. It makes it look like the administration is bumbling and incompetent. And that was combined, as Noah said, with the Delta variant surge in the late summer, numbers spiking after Biden had previously, around the 4th of July, declared victory over and declared independence from the virus. So that, too, added to that narrative. And then, of course, inflation, which we'll talk about more in our next segment as well. And just the in general, it's not just inflation. I mean, it's things related to inflation, like the supply chain issues, the fact that this week I go to the grocery store and half the cereal aisle, the shelves are bare. It looks like walking down an aisle in the Soviet Union and all the toilet paper is gone. And then the next week, the cereal's back, but then now there's no ketchup or whatever it is. Now milk is out. It, it, we're living in an environment where economically things just feel sort of off. Like, yeah, the prices are rising at the pump. I go to the store, shelves are empty. I want to buy a car and they say they won't have any in stock for eight months. I try to order Christmas presents for the family and I see the delivery date is February 22nd when I order it in <laughs> November. These are not normal things. And even though the economy is growing at a good clip and unemployment is technically quite low, we're in this weird position where it kind of it's humming along and yet it feels broken somehow. And I then think you're, you're right, Damon. Yeah. I, I think that's right. You're, you're yeah, accurately I, describing what people are feeling. I'm a phenomenologist. I <laughs> describe <laughs> the feeling of subjectivity in the world. And to loop back to close, uh, Mona, your initial question, is it the ideological thing? Well, yeah, that's been going on too. And I think in addition to losing independence, there is this feeling of like, hasn't the Congress been doing this for like six months now? Mm -hmm. Like what what is happening? We're stuck in a kind of... I suspended animation where all these other things that seem out of control are going on and all Congress can do can fight amongst themselves while they try to figure out how to pass these gigantic bills. And I frankly think a lot of Americans think this is contrary to what Democrats want us to think, which is that, look how they're going to pass all these great things to help my life get easier. I think it looks more like, oh, that's just what Washington does. They're absorbed in this kind of infighting. And in the end, these bad things are going on and they're focused on this other stuff that isn't really about me. So that's kind of my global diagnosis of why, why things aren't going well. And a very good one it was, yeah. too. Okay, so Bill Galston, Damon says the Democratic leadership is sort of off point, not dealing with what voters are experiencing. And that's part of the problem. Also, I have a question for you. Analyst of all things Democratic 
If the Democrats were sincere in believing that Donald Trump and Trumpism represents an existential threat to this democracy, wouldn't you think that they would want to rally around and make Biden a successful president? And if that means trimming back on some of their more progressive fantasies, to do so because Biden badly needs wins, he badly needs to be perceived as successful and in command, and yet they are withholding that from him. So maybe they don't take the threat of Trump and Trumpism as seriously as they claim. The tyranny of the short term has never been more dominant. I would suggest that we hold our horses and reconvene this conversation in, let us say, the end of January. Because there is a rhythm to affairs on Capitol Hill, especially when there's a a big agenda, stalled almost as badly as the ships around the Los Angeles Harbor. A lot of those ships, I predict, are going to be unloaded by the time of the Christmas break for Congress, whenever that is. So I think the argument that All of the bickering inside the party, which has been unattractive to say the least, has permanently stalled the Biden agenda in a way that will convince the American people that the Democrats are incapable of governing. That may turn out to be true, but it is much too early, in my opinion, to reach that conclusion. It is not too early to have reached other conclusions. And uh, one of them is that the American people certainly do perceive that from their standpoint, the party has moved too far to the left. And so I present as Exhibit A, a Quinnipiac poll headline, a slight majority of Americans, 52%, say that the Democratic Party has moved too far to the left. Well, that sounds bad. Compare this to what they say about the Republican Party. 35% say that the Republican Party has moved too far to the right. So 52 too far to the left for Democrats, 35 too far to the right for Republicans. A plurality of Americans say that the Republican Party hasn't moved too far in either direction, which is certainly not what they're saying about the Democratic Party. So I do think that the Democratic Party in power has governed farther to the left than the baseline expectation of the American people. There's no question about that. And the question is, what is to be done about that? And when will the party start doing it, if ever? There's also no question about the fact that until very recently, the topic that has risen to the top of economic concerns, namely inflation, was not given sufficient notice by the administration. I'm aware of the fact that the next segment is on inflation, but I will just put that proposition down on the table and wait to explain it until the next segment. And in general, the administration did seem to be out of sync with what I'll call emerging issues, issues that forced their way onto the agenda despite the fact that the administration had other ideas not only inflation, but also crime, not only crime, but problems at the southern border, not only problems at the southern border, but problems in the schools, some of which had to do with reopening and masking, which then got all caught up in in a narrower debate about critical race theory, et cetera. So there is a feeling of out of syncness. There's no question about that. I, with many others, misinterpreted, or I'd say underinterpreted, the consequences for the Biden presidency of the retreat from Afghanistan, which did indeed, as others have said, shake up one of the core reasons that people voted for Biden last November. And that is this perception of competence, knowing how to do it. And the other perception of Biden, namely that he was elected not to be the next FDR, but to end the chaos and cool the temperature, which was Abigail Spanberger's view, much quoted, I think is substantially correct. Let me make one other concluding comment. The observation by some speakers already that, well, the Biden retreat from Afghanistan was actually better than it looks. 
reminds me of Mark Twain's famous comment that Wagner's music is better than it sounds. (laughs) (laughs) Well, on that note, get it? Um, (laughs) Let us turn to our second topic. And we are delighted that Noah is here because, Noah, you've been on this for a long time. When you were talking just a minute ago, I was thinking, do I remember correctly that many months ago you had a post saying, here's when I will begin to get worried, when politicians begin to say things like, it's all the fault of the big oil companies or whatever. Did you? Are you the one who said that? <laughs> I am. In fact, yeah. I just tweeted about that right before this podcast by pure coincidence. Yeah. Um, I didn't actually say that. What I said is that when either the administration or the Fed starts to say that price controls are the solution to inflation, that's it. That's then it. we're in trouble. Right. And so that's that's what Nixon did. Yep. That was Nixon's response to inflation as price controls in the early 70s. It did not work at all. Inflation dipped a little after the very first shock of the oil shock, but it quickly came back, that, that's what eventually led to the, uh, the gasoline lines, which became the sort of iconic image of the 70s right. and really became associated with the Carter presidency and, and some would argue ultimately sunk Carter. And so, you know, Hugo Chavez and every other charismatic populist leader of the left and right who has faced inflation pretty much says it, it's hoarders, it's speculators, we need price controls to stop this, and then you get the empty shelves, and then you get the black markets, and then you get more inflation because people decide, okay, this government has no intention of doing the actual monetary policy that is needed to control inflation. And so then people raise their prices in anticipation of this. You get this expectation spiral, and then inflation goes up more, and then your country's really screwed at that point. So that is when to get scared. We didn't get a hyperinflationary spiral, but it was pretty bad by the end of the 70s, and it did cause a big upheaval and a generational political shift and screwed up the Democrats a lot. Now, the Biden administration has not called for price controls yet, but it has depicted high gas prices as sort of malfeasance by companies. That may even be true. Companies can do some stuff and we can have uncompetitive markets. But when you start to say that this is the cause of inflation and we need to do this instead of monetary policy, well, then we're in trouble. You know, if Trump comes back in and gets reelected in 2024, that's even worse because Trump is notoriously a low interest rate guy and he would be absolutely the kind of Hugo Chavez type figure to avoid appointing any Fed chair that would raise interest rates. Trump would never appoint a Volcker type because the Volcker type would just cause a recession to get rid of inflation. And that would result in Trump being disgraced and being a failure. You know, like the only reason we really beat inflation before is because of Carter. Carter was not much of a populist. He was sort of this sourpuss guy who, you know, ultimately went down to defeat against the more populist Reagan. But Carter is the one who whipped inflation because he's the one who appointed Volcker. Volcker was this known hawk And nobody in the 70s was willing to just rip off the Band-Aid and appoint a hawk who would just cause a sharp recession and just smash inflation for a generation. Carter did it. He appointed Volcker. Volcker smashed inflation. And the first of the Volcker recessions was in 1980, an election year. And that might have had a lot to do with why Carter lost to Reagan, too. But Carter bit the bullet and he did it. And so sort of like Biden ripped off the Band-Aid with Afghanistan and took a big hit for it, but it was something that needed to happen eventually. And so if inflation keeps going up and if we get this expectation spiral where people decide the government doesn't care about inflation, we're going to need someone to do the hard work and take the hit of appointing a new Volcker who will just smash inflation, cause a recession. We caused a recession, two recessions, actually, the, the Volcker recessions, which were not long, but they were very big and sharp and they had sort of permanent negative consequences for our industrial base. And it was very painful. And we waited too long to raise rates. We waited a decade to raise rates. It was too painful. And so what Biden needs to do now is make sure that we have a Fed chair who is willing to start raising rates slowly now so that we don't have to volker the economy in five or seven or 10 years. Except the two people that he's rumored to be considering, the sitting chair, Jerome Powell, who's a dove, and Lyle Brainard, who I don't know much about her, but apparently we don't she's- know. Nobody does. Okay. We don't know where she stands, but neither one, let's put it this way, is known to be a, a hawk on monetary policy, right? That's right. Neither of them is a Volcker type. But that's probably fine right now because we don't need to volker the economy. Volkering the economy is like 
the end of that Thor movie when when Thor just lets the fire demon destroy Asgard just to prevent the bad guy from getting it. That's vulkering the economy. You just say, I can't defeat you, but he can. And okay. then poof, <laughs> the high interest rates just come out and just smash everything. And then you're, you get a Rust Belt. Remember the Rust Belt? I mean, part of that was international competition, but a lot of that was just what we had to do to stop inflation. Right. By the way, your description of Jimmy Carter as a sourpuss kind of made me smile because I am old enough to remember when Jimmy Carter was running as Mr. Sunshine. He had this big, wide grin, and he was Mr. Honesty, and he was religious, and he was- He changed, the, didn't he? <laughs> he did. He, the, yes, he did change. But anyway, just- he Put just, on a sweater and talk <laughs> about malaise, right? Isn't that the- <laughs> right. Um. But all right, so so they should gently raise interest rates. Is that the Noah Smith recommendation? Yes. He, a tiny, tiny bit? Okay, all right. Because and that, that, because that would signal. signal seriousness about dealing with inflation. Right, and the thing is that that's actually not going to get rid of 5% inflation. So mm-hmm. what we have to manage expectations here. Raising rates a little bit, what that will do is it will convince all the participants who really matter, which is banks and big companies, right, uh, to inflation, that the legacy of Volcker is still in place. The Fed still fundamentally is willing to do what it needs to do to control inflation. Yellen did this when she was Fed chair. She came in and did a small rate hike. We didn't get a recession, but we got a mini slowdown that may have contributed to Trump's victory. It's not clear, but we, we could do it with only a small rate hike. So people who are afraid of these giant rate hikes don't be what we need to do. That, that's what we'll need to do if inflation doubles or triples and it's like seven years down the line, we've been having this for a long time. At that point, you need to bring out the big hammer, right? But we're not there yet. Mm. A small rise in interest rates will convince the country, will convince the banks, will convince the big companies that the Fed is still the Fed and the Fed will still do what it needs to do. And so a little pain now would save a whole lot of pain later. And the question is, Do we have the foresight to say, okay, we're going to do like a small hike now just to convince everybody that the legacy of Volcker is still in place, that we haven't left that era, you know, so we don't have to do a lot later. That's what needs to happen. Yeah. Okay. Damon, one of the things that has been dismaying about Biden's leadership is that he has elected to continue Trump's tariff policies. And he's all about, we're going to buy American, and which I think is not a good idea in general, but especially when we're facing inflation. And that is one thing that he, he can do unilaterally you know, is, is lower tariffs. But anyway, I just wanted to say that Larry Summers in a piece for the Washington Post mentioned reducing tariffs as a great way to begin to fight inflation. So I felt very vindicated. What do you think? I would say that in general is a good idea in specific cases when it it has to do with interactions with geopolitical considerations like China. I think it's a more it's a more complicated scenario because then we're in the position of potentially seeming like we're rewarding a global adversary when all we really want to do is try to stanch inflation here. So in the case of China and maybe a few others, I think it's something that would have to be looked at and thought about pretty closely. But in general, yeah, I think that is one way to try to help a little bit. I doubt it would get rid of it because I think the causes of inflation are complex at the moment and are connected mainly at the core to the supply chain issues. We're all bunched up. (laughs) We just have products not getting to where they're supposed to be going and lots of orders coming in. And so prices are rising because people aren't getting what they want. And as long as that's happening, that's going to be the primary thing. But of course, anything we can do to try to lower the inflationary pressures is a good thing. Um, One thing I actually wanted to ask Noah, since we have an economist on the program, and you've been talking about the Volcker years in the 70s. This is a question as in my economic ignorance, I really don't know the answer to. But our interest rates and whether you raise them or not to combat inflation, are they just relative? So if you're at 10% and you get inflation, you, you just have to raise them from that. And if we're at whatever we are now, what point to five for prime rate. Like if you raise it to like two, that's like a lot. Because if you go back, I like while we were talking, I looked up the prime rate through the 70s and it is like a glimpse of a completely alternative universe where Mm -hmm. like 
before Volcker, we were around 9%. And then we get 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Then it sort of stabilizes around that through 1980, perhaps because the election was coming up. But no, no. Then by February of 80, we're up to 16, 17, and it peaks April 2nd, 1980 at 20% prime rate. Like we've been in effectively like in negative rates for a while. And even even under Obama, we were kind of skidding along in the low single digits for years. So is it the case that we could maybe combat our 6.2% inflation at the moment by going up to say 1.5 or 2%? That, again, is sort of a question for Noah. I mean, I I really don't. What is the answer to that? I think there's two answers to this. So the first answer is that the purpose of a rate hike, a small rate hike, will not be to cause inflation to go from 5% back down to 2%, although it might. But the purpose of the small rate hike is to prevent it from going to 15 20%. Because right now, we don't have an expectation spiral yet but it's starting to look worrying. So you can look at market expectations of what inflation will be by looking at various bonds, which tell you what the market thinks inflation will be in five years. And for a while, when inflation was just you know starting for the first few months, those weren't rising at all. People were like, okay, inflation's contained. It's going to go back down. Now it's starting to rise. That is scary because that expectation spiral is the scariest thing. So The point of hiking rates to like one and a half or 2% or whatever is not because that's a high interest rate. It's not. But the point of that is to reassure everybody that we won't let it get to 15, 20%. The the Fed is on the case. And so that's what that is. So to get it back to 2% is going to be harder. That's probably going to take a couple years. Supply chain kinks will have to work themselves out and blah, blah, blah. In fact, we don't want to kill the economy just to bring inflation from 5% to 2%. That's not worth it. We just want to prevent it from going to 15%. You see what I'm saying? And yeah, so that's, yeah. Animal that's, that's spirits. Sort of the first point. That's right. <laughs> yeah. The cost of causing a Volcker type recession to bring inflation from 5 to 2%, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. So, so we don't need to bring out the big Volcker hammer. But also... Another thing to understand about the 70s, I think, is that nobody understood that the Fed would ever do something like that. The idea that the Fed would ever raise interest rates to that high and crash the economy intentionally just to stop inflation, that was something that had never been done. We had literally never had a central bank do anything like that before in the history of really the world. We'd been on the gold standard, and then we post-World War II, we'd had this fast growth with like modest inflation. No one had any idea that a Volcker type thing was even possible. Volcker had to cause that calamity. Volcker had to smash the economies of like Michigan and Ohio and smash the U.S. economy for like three years. Basically, he did that to prove that it could be done. And the idea was that if you prove it could be done, you'll never have to do it again because now everyone knows that the big hammer is there. It really exists. It's not just hypothetical. And so if we maintain that credibility that Volcker established, we never have to do it again. We never have to Volcker the economy again. But maintaining that credibility will require doing things like doing modest rate hikes when inflation gets above target. It will require things like that to maintain that credibility. And so I think that, God willing, we will never have to Volcker the economy again. But let's not let it get to that point. I think that's my message. Linda, this talk about Jimmy Carter, there, he does not usually get remembered for having appointed Volcker or actually, for that matter, for also having started the big military buildup after the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. <laughs> but he did that, too. Um, things that Reagan continued. But, after uh, boycotting the Olympics didn't work. Well, right. <laughs> anyway. um, actually, Biden just announced, I think, there's going to be a diplomatic boycott of the <laughs> Beijing Olympics. But anyway. Um, but uh, so we were giving Reagan uh, the credit for Volcker when actually it belongs, mm-hmm. to, uh, belongs to Carter. But I... I find, and I hope that they're listening. I mean, it, it, so for the last several months, there's been this debate about, you know, whether inflation was temporary or transitory or not transitory. And all the left wing people in the Democratic Party really hate Larry Summers. And so they didn't want to listen to him when he was warning about inflation, which, by the way, so were those of us on uh, Beg to Differ. But in any event, um, Now it seems, you know, that that there's just, there's been a turn. There's really no denying it anymore, no claiming, I think, that it's 
just transitory or just a few a few commodities. Uh, it's pretty obviously systemic at this point. So we can we can hope that that means the the administration will be receptive. On the other hand, as we were discussing in the last segment, the administration has not shown great nimbleness in changing direction. Well, that is true. I'd sort of like to raise- Of course, it's not up to them. It's up to the Fed. But it is up to Biden who to appoint. But anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, (laughs) I have to tell you, monetary policy is not my forte. Um, But there are uh, other things besides monetary policy that can, I believe, affect uh, inflation. And one of them is shortages. And it seems to me we have two shortages going on in the country right now, which I think are cause for alarm and cause for concern. And if we don't do something about them, are going to um, add to inflationary pressures. And one is a labor shortage. I mean, we have uh, problems in the supply chain, yes, but that we also have problems in getting the goods that may in fact be at the docks unloaded into trucks and driven across country, put on shelves, and then sold to customers. And a lot of that has to do with the labor shortage. It's it's not just uh, the supply chain. It is the fact that we don't have people in the workforce doing the jobs that get goods to market and into people's hands. And we're not dealing with that at all. You know, we have, as I talk endlessly on this program. What would you suggest? I mean, the... the um... Well, one of the things I would suggest is immigration reform. We need more people. We need more workers mm. um, who are willing to do jobs and to do them at a non-inflationary price. So I, th- I think that's one of the issues. I'm also very concerned about housing shortages. Um I spend a lot of my time dealing in the in the real estate arena because that's part of the way I'm going to finance my retirement uh, if I ever um, do retire, which does, is looking increasingly less likely. But uh, we don't you know, want it, you to, Linda. <laughs> as, as as I look, um, you know, I buy and sell real estate uh, and rental housing, and what I am seeing is just an outrageous increase in the price of of housing uh, that that is driven in part because there are shortages. Um, people were not moving during the pandemic. We're also not building houses at the same rate. And part of the reason we're not building houses at the same rate as we were during the boom is that we don't have people to hang the drywall, to put on the roofs, you know, to hammer in the nails, to, you know, create the frames for housing, et cetera. And so, you know, I I think this is a very complicated issue. There are lots of factors that are going into play into people's economic anxiety. And I think too often in Washington, we think very narrowly. I I think it's probably a good idea to see some adjustment in prime rate. And and I don't think it would have any kind of a disaster effect. And I'm old enough to have bought a house and to have paid 19 and and a half, I think, percent interest on the mortgage on that house. So Mm. we're never going to, I hope to goodness that we're never going to get back uh, to that point. But basically paying two, three percent interest on housing, I mean, this is such an historically low rate. So if if they do in fact raise prime rate and that trickles down into the to the housing market, uh, the loans that, that banks give for mortgages, it'll have some impact, which would, you know, apply some pressure, I guess, in terms of prices continuing to go up. But if we started building more houses, if we started having more dynamism uh, in the market, uh, I think it would ease that. But nobody seems to be talking about these issues. Um, I certainly don't, you know, hear the administration talking about they'd like to talk about anything but immigration reform. And, you know, maybe for some very good political reasons, because it is it has become such a uh, a third rail in American politics and to the advantage uh, of uh, Trump and, and, and the Republicans. But wait, wait a second. Immigration reform is in the uh, Build Back Better bill. There's uh, there's substantial immigration reform in there. Right. And it's probably not going to get passed. Right. That well, that, that is probably going to, yes, the parliamentarian is right. probably going to refuse it. Right. But, Absolutely. Know, they they, they right. did put it up there. They did put yeah. it up there. No, no. I, I, yes, that you're right. Uh, and I, they should be given some credit for that, but um, it, it's probably not going to, in, in my view, it's unlikely to be in the, the final bill. And frankly, I would rather that, you know, we did this in a more sensible way than just 
lopping it on to a, a big omnibus spending bill. I mean, I think we really need rethinking about our immigration policy. We need major reform, and nobody wants to touch that. Bill Galston, let's say this for the the, the transitory crowd, okay? If you have a Fed that is perceived to be reliable and will not allow inflation to spiral out of control, then it does make sense to say, you know what? We had a pandemic, all kinds of things changed. Lots of people quit their jobs, changed, whatever. So many things are different. The price system, magical as it is, will work this all out in due course. I mean, yeah, the prices for some things will go up. The prices for other things will go down. Where there are shortages, they will be supplied because the price will go up. And, um, and you know, you just have to wait for it to shake out. Well, Mona, as I argued in my Wall Street Journal column this week, I think we are we are misreading inflation in the United States and where we are historically. In my view, we have gone through 40 years of a low inflation, low interest rate environment, steady declines through most of the 40-year period with some ups and downs, but the trend was unmistakable. That period occurred for certain, I think, geopolitical reasons uh, and certain demographic reasons, which are no longer in operation and, in fact, are going into reverse. So, in my view, we are about to enter a fundamentally new era in which the easy assumptions of the past 40 years that we could do anything we wanted in fiscal policy and just about everything else and it would make no difference. Uh, those easy, comfortable assumptions are going to have to be re-examined and in many cases discarded. What do I have in mind? Well, let me start with Linda started. In the 1970s, the U.S. labor force was growing at 2.6% per annum. 1980s was 1.6. 1990s, 1.3. The BLS projections for the next decade peg it at 0.5. And Many other analysts put it even lower than that. The U.S. labor force growth is grinding to a halt, and we have picked, as Linda has argued, the worst possible time to turn off the immigration spigot. Point number two on the labor force, we globalized the labor force with the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Soviet Union, the emergence of China into the global economy. And the Chinese labor force in particular growth has now peaked, and it is actually going to begin to shrink quite soon. We are no longer going to have the advantage of an ever-expanding labor force at home or abroad. We took – inflation was restrained by globalization. It was restrained by the easing of, of trade. Uh, it was restrained by just-in-time supply lines. I could go on and on. Basic structural changes in the economy, all of which rested on assumptions which I believe are now defunct. So that's the frame within which we need to think about the questions immediately before us. Let me downshift for just a minute to the medium term. One of the most important choke points in the economy is, is chips. You know, semiconductor chips. And according to the chairman of Intel and other knowledgeable sources, it's going to take not months, but years to deal with the chip shortage because demand for chips is exploding. And that's not just a functioning of reopening the economy. It's a function of how we've chosen to manufacture all sorts of things. Well, let's take a look at the ports in the supply chain. Once again, Linda was on to something the United States, for reasons good and bad, decided to shift fundamentally from a rail system to a truck system for the transport of goods. We are now short, according to the, you know, the American Truckers Association, by 80,000 truckers. Many of them just checked out during the pandemic and said they never want to do that work again. It was bad for their health, bad for their family life. They've had it. Who's going to fill those trucks? You know, to say nothing of you, know, I could go on and on with the things that will have to change in order to unsnarl the system at the at the ports and 
you know, and what happens to the goods after they're offloaded from these very large ships. So I think we have to think structurally about where we are and begin to react accordingly. Short-termism and incrementalism, in my judgment, will not serve us well in the years to come or even in the months to come. All right. We now turn to our third topic. In honor of the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday, I have asked the panel to cite something that they are grateful for in the way America is working. We spend a lot of time detailing the ways in which things have gone off the rails. Um, So I thought it would be good to focus on some of the more positive aspects of life in these United States. And Linda Chavez, I start with you. Well, um, it's, uh, I don't know (laughs) how thankful I am for this because it took a very terrible event to have occurred to get to this point, but at least we are now finally uh, seeing some justice being meted out to the insurrectionists of January 6th. Judges are now handing down what are pretty serious sentences, and the most recent was this week with Jacob Chansley who was the guy who ran around bare-chested, tattooed, and horns on his head and uh, sitting in the well of the United States Senate uh, on that January 6th. He was known as the QAnon shaman. And he received this week, thanks to a Reagan-era appointed judge, a 41-month sentence for his activities, even though he was not charged with a violent uh, attack against anyone. The fact that he was considered a leader, the fact that he did what he did, he became the face uh, of the insurrection, got him handed a meaty sentence. And I, for one, am glad of that. I hope it discourages further fools from taking to the streets and and marching on capitals uh, and trying to engage uh, in insurrection. Okay. Damon Linker. Well, this uh, this might sound like I'm kissing up to Noah, but I'm really not, although I very much like Noah's Substack. Um, I'm going to actually say that I'm grateful for Substack, which uh, as a journalist, uh, you know, there's not a lot of good news in that field. Uh, if, if you've worked in journalism for a while, as I have, uh, it's quite normal to, you know, every year or so to have good friends of yours getting laid off companies and public Publications that you like and admire, uh, dissolving, getting purchased, changed, uh, broken apart. Um, a lot of downward pressure on uh, salaries and the, just the number of people who actively work as journalists is always going down because there were fewer opportunities and jobs. But Substack is a company that four years ago was just getting organized. It had no followers or subscribers. And just this week, the founders of the company company announced that they have 1 million paying subscribers. That's a huge success in business terms. And frankly, I think it's a model that is going to be very positive for journalism, especially opinion journalism going forward. We read pieces of journalism, not because of the kind of media brand they work for or belong to, but because of that writer. So why not subscribe to the writer rather than an overarching brand where several writers receive a salary? So you subscribe to the person who does the work. And more broadly, I just think this is a vindication of the kind of American uh, economic innovation in the best sense. Here's a couple company that came around it had a totally you know by contemporary journalistic standards a bizarre upside down idea and model for how to do business. It tried it and it's been very successful and it's great. I could go on for probably 10 minutes listing all the very interesting people who are on Substack. I'm discovering new ones all the time. So bravo to that company. Right. And it, it also... And, and of course, thank you. And this means subscribe to my Substack, right? Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Bulwark, Bulwark listeners, subscribe to my Substack. And, and the Bulwark is on Substack as the well. The Bulwark is so. on Substack. Yes, we are. Yes. Um, That's so, true. Uh, That's true. Uh, and it's also, a, you know, one of the nice things about America and about our capitalist system is that it leaves room for this kind of business inventiveness. So that's a good thing. Yeah, that's the, right. that was the broader point. That yeah. it, it's a sign of American dy- dynamistic capitalism. 
capitalism at its best. Yes. All right. Noah Smith. All right. So what I'm uh, grateful for is something that I think many people don't even realize or accept is happening. And I've gotten huge pushback when I suggest that this is a thing. I think that popular unrest in America is starting to recede. And that's a that's an unpopular thing to say. But I think that what we really saw in the early 2000s, maybe 2013, 14, we saw a, an explosion of this restlessness, this, this idea that things need to be shaken up and changed. And we saw that on the left, of course, with the rise of what we now call wokeness. We saw that on the right with what the rise of what we now call Trumpism. And I think that the popular desire for this is slowly ebbing. I think that you can feel this on social media, so but you can also see, you know, we, we haven't had the kind of stochastic terrorist attacks, you know, in the in the in the years before right before Trump got elected and then right after Trump got elected, you saw vicious street battles between the right and the left. You saw acts of random terrorism, synagogue shootings, racist shootings. You also saw, you know, terrorist shootings with people claiming to be doing the work of ISIS. You saw a couple of those too in 2015, 16, um, you know, killings of police, things like that. Then you saw the, the biggest protests in American history, first the Women's March and then the even bigger George Floyd protests. But even by the time of the Floyd protests, I think I could feel the desire for popular violence starting to ebb and the Floyd protests, you know, were not particularly violent. Uh, you know, protesters... I think didn't kill anyone. Uh, you know, police police did shoot a few people, but then, but overall, it was you know less violent than the riots of like the '60s or or you know the '90s. And so then, I think even by then you could start to see this. And I think COVID and the Trump election and the coup attempt and all this stuff sort of prolonged this period of unrest a little bit past its its sort of sell by date and made us feel it was still going on. But I think that we're just not seeing random like mail bombers. Now we're not seeing people just walk into places and, and, you know, shoot them up. You know, we did see, we did see a, a murder of several Asian people, but it's not clear whether that was politically motivated uh, killing in that instance. Um, so we haven't really seen this, this kind of stuff that we really did see in the mid 2000s, you know, in, in 2014 through like 17, 18. Um, so I think that our period of unrest is, is actually ebbing. And if we can avoid a, you know, civil war institutional breakdown in 2024, you know, sort of a election theft and, you know, constitutional crisis is military standoff kind of thing, then our country is going to be okay, because I think people are getting exhausted. They realize that, you know, a lot of the, the appetite for radical change, it's not going to happen. We're going to see incremental change. And a lot of that change is going to be good. Um, some of that not so good, maybe. But um, that's what I'm actually thankful for, is a country that seems to be just now starting to calm down. What do you think of that? Well, I'll tell you what we think of it, because actually, when you did a post about this a number of months ago, we discussed it on Beg to Differ. So uh, I found it really interesting. Thank you. Thank and you. Sorry, I, I hope you're right. Thanks. I hope you're right. That's all I can say. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. There are also a lot of other indicators out there. You know, the number of people who are threatening school boards and and election workers and and Republicans who vote for the infrastructure bill with severe bodily harm. That kind of thing is on the rise. So who knows? Yeah, they're they're threatening, not doing. I just want to say. Yeah, yet. we hope. We hope. Yeah. Right. Okay. Bill Galston. I'm grateful for. A couple of things, if I'm allowed to go over my quota. First of all, although it is much abused, I'm grateful for American technology, which in many areas continues to lead the world and has given us hope, just to pick the most obvious example, of getting out of this pandemic, I won't say unscathed, but a lot less scathed than we would have been uh, if it had taken as long to develop the vaccines as most experts believed when the pandemic began. Uh, technology has gotten a bad rap recently for all sorts of reasons that I can understand, many of which I accept. But there's a good side as well, and I think we should be grateful for the improvements in our lives that it has made and will continue to make. Secondly, and even more counterintuitively, 
The survival of democracy rests on its capacity for self-correction. But there can be no self-correction that does not begin with self-criticism. And so I am not so gloomy about the orgy of self-criticism that we are now inflicting on ourselves because I think there will be a kind of marketplace of ideas where the wheat and the chaff get sorted out and the areas where we can reach a broad agreement that there are things that aren't going as well as they could be that need to be improved uh, will gradually form an agenda of reform for the American people. One of the most dramatic phenomena of the current political scene is that we do not have, as we so often do, one party of the status quo and the other party of change. Both parties are parties of change right now. They do not agree on the direction of that change, but I think they do reflect the fact that across the political landscape, across the ideological spectrum, there is self-criticism going on that I think will prove to have positive results in the long run, even if we can't see them now. Okay, amen to that. All right, I would like to cite something that is that we hardly ever think about. We just take it for granted, and it has been a feature of American life for so many decades now, and that is low corruption. We do, of course, have some. Every society does. But the reason I was thinking about this is in reading some of the accounts uh, from Afghanis about why it was that the Afghan government was so vulnerable to the Taliban. You know, a lot of Afghans really hated the Taliban. Nevertheless, one of the things that th- that drove them completely around the bend about the old government was that it was so corrupt that every encounter with a policeman or an official had to involve a bribe. And, you know, we, again, with all full acknowledgement that we have our problems, basically, if you get a speeding ticket, you don't expect to have to pay off the cop. If you want to get a building permit, you don't have to come with a suitcase of cash. If you want to, uh, you know, make improvements in your neighborhood, there isn't some powerful force standing in your way because it's paid off all the local officials. For the most part, again, as I say, that is something that makes for a good society and that, and that is, I'm grateful for it. Okay, that almost felt like a highlight and low light of the week, but, but that actually wasn't. So now we will go to that segment. And I will start with you, Linda. Highlight or low light? It's both, as I often like to choose. Uh, It's an article in today's Bulwark. It's by uh, my friend and a friend of the podcast. He's been on at least once, uh, Ron Radosh. It is entitled Steve Bannon and MAGA Martyrdom. And the subtitle is A Practitioner of Leninist Tactics. He can be expected to make the most of the contempt of Congress charges he faces. Uh, Ron was the uh, first person to bring to my attention the name of of Steve Bannon many years ago. Uh, He apparently met uh, Bannon uh, at a book signing at uh, Bannon's townhouse in which Bannon walked up to Ron Radosh and said, I am a Leninist. And he did so uh, because he knew that uh, Ron Radish himself was a red diaper baby, had been very much on the left, and he knew that uh, Radosh would understand the reference. Uh, and Radosh actually thought better of it and changed his mind. Oh, yes, position. he changed yes, yes. his mind should, very much. We should, we should uh, say that. <laughs> yes, for those who don't run. I, I just always <laughs> assume everybody realized that he had very much a, a change of heart uh, and a turn. But um, I, I think it's a very important article because I think that we underestimate uh, the way in which people like uh, Bannon are employing the tactics of the totalitarian left. And Bannon uh, is very much aware of what he's doing it. And I don't think he's called out enough on it. So I think uh, I commend this article to our readers. I think it puts a whole new light on Steve Bannon and his uh, shenanigans and his danger to the Republic, because he's more than an autocrat. He has uh, totalitarian instincts and tendencies. Okay. Damon Linker. 
Uh, I'll begin by just saying I wholeheartedly agree with that. Steve Bannon is the worst person who was affiliated with the Trump administration, hands down, without any second thoughts from me. Bad, bad man. Okay, uh, you know, because Mona, you know, strong-armed me into giving a, a positive thing uh, for Thanksgiving, uh, I now will have to go negative for my uh, my selection this week for a low light. Uh, a, a very sad uh, bit of news reported in the Washington Post about new government data released this week showing that over the uh, one-year period from April 2020 to April 2021, 100,000 Americans died of drug overdoses. Now, immediately on like on Twitter and other online forums, uh, conservatives or right-wingers, I should say, immediately pounced on this, like, see, that shows lockdowns were a mistake. And, you know, we can debate whether lockdowns were the best approach to the pandemic, especially the first few months. But um, it, it's an undoubtedly true that this trend became worse because of the isolation uh, that followed from this public health emergency that we've just lived through. But the trend was already there. We've gone from roughly 20,000 deaths in 2001 to 40,000 deaths, uh, this is on an annual basis, in 2011, 60,000 around 2015, 80,000 in 2019. So we would have hit 100,000 deaths in 2021 or 22 if it weren't for the pandemic. And that points to a much deeper and broader problem that's really illustrated by an even more alarming chart. If you look at the Washington Post piece on this, showing uh, annual death rate per 100,000 people from drugs throughout the European Union, including Turkey and Norway. At the low end, you have Turkey and Poland at 0.4 deaths per 100,000 from drugs. At the high end, except for the U.S., you have Norway at 5 per 100,000. And standing out from the crowd four times higher than that, actually more than four times, the United States at 21.1 per 100,000. Something is very wrong with our culture in this country if this is happening. It's obviously a very complicated problem. I just filed before recording this podcast a column reflecting on what some of those causes could be, but it's something that should trouble all of us, and we'll maybe come back to it on a later edition of the podcast. Very good, yes. Okay, Noah Smith. So my, uh, my highlight of the week... I picked one that went along with my sort of thing I'm thankful for. My highlight of the week is a cheesy romantic comedy on Netflix called Love Hard. And this is a kind of forgettable romantic comedy. It's very standard, hits all the, you know, standard beats. It was the most popular thing on Netflix. And the critics panned it, you know, the the critics camp with all kinds of reasons to poo-poo it. And it was ignored by elite culture. And, you know, we, we live in an age when people tell us that quotidian sort of daily life concerns like romance, you know, are, should be shelved while we fix our society, while we change our society, that now is not the time for love. Now is the time for politics and for marching in the streets and for overthrowing things and for the personal is political, et cetera, et cetera. And just being a human being is on hold. And I think people are starting to drift away from that because despite the fact that, you know, critics ignored it and despite the fact that it's this cheesy kind of romantic comedy that hasn't been very popular in America, it was hugely popular on Netflix and was the number one thing on Netflix. And I think you can, uh, you know, go, go watch that movie. It's cheesy. It's, you know, it's a rom-com it's, uh, you know, reasonably derivative, uh, but, but cute and really heartwarming. And, um, there's these small glimmers of return to normalcy. And I think that that's one. Boy, I hope so. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a shot. Okay. Bill Galston. I can provide a kind of frame around Noah's highlight. I am a survey research nut, as I guess the followers of this podcast <laughs> know by now. And just today, the Pew Research Center came out with an international study comparing sources of meaning as reported by the populations of 17 advanced democracies. There's this rap on the United States that 
we're all a bunch of individualists, if not hyper individualists, and that we don't play well with others. We don't care enough about them. We're all solipsists sunk in our own careers and, uh, and in our own psyches and woes. Well, guess what? The United States ranks higher on the share of people who identify family as the source of meaning than virtually any other country. We rank very high on the scale of countries who give priority to friends and community life and to civic engagement. And by contrast, all of the alleged communitarian countries, especially in Southeast Asia, look a lot more hyper-individualistic than we do when you get right down to it. And so finding pleasure in rom-coms uh, I think may be a small manifestation of the fact that we we take much more meaning from the things that are closest to us as individuals and human beings, namely our relationships with others, than a lot of other populations and a lot of other countries do. That's really interesting. All right. Um, I would like to highlight a piece that appeared in the dispatch. It was by Jonah Goldberg, Mugged by Fallacy. It's his uh, take on the latest National Conservatism Conference recently held in Florida. And he, you know, is, is, uh, he, he doesn't hold back, let's put it that way. And he says, you know, this this idea that the nationalist conservatives, which he points out is really not a very well-defined term, but the one of the ideas that they put forward, and he specifically cites Chris DeMuth, former president of the American Enterprise Institute, who is now in this camp, is that the left has become so terrible, so existentially frightening that there is no choice but for the right to take extreme action in response and to uh, break rules and norms and so forth. And so Goldberg says, look, you want to talk about the left being tough? Think back to the 60s and 70s. He says, when the militant left wasn't dedicated merely to blowing up binary gender categories, but to blowing up buildings and occasionally people with real bombs. During the summer of 1970 alone, there were 20 bombings a week in California. Quote, it's a wonderful feeling to hit a pig, unquote, Mark Rudd of the Weather Underground mused. And there was a lot more like that. And uh, so, so he makes a very valuable point that, uh, that to suggest that the left is somehow changed or different or worse now is really uh, ahistorical. I would also point to a piece in the, the Bulwark from Jonathan V. Last, where he touched on the same subject, talking about these natcons, as he calls them. And he says, look, um, so I'm sorry to report that when you try to reform a conservative movement with 50 million adherents, a guy like Chris DeMuth does not wind up in charge. A guy like Donald Trump does. Anyway, he says it's really not at all about policy, that these are people who are attempting to sidle up to power. So I recommend both of those. Jonathan's was the Triad, which is a newsletter that you are entitled to when you become a Bulwark Plus member. And of course, the uh, same thing goes for the Jonah Goldberg piece. You have to be a dispatch member. But um, as we were saying about Substack, it's a great new era in which you can choose which particular writers you want to patronize. And of course, the Bulwark has all the best ones. <laughs> it's one-stop shopping. All right. Now, I want to let you all know that we will not be recording next week because we record on Thursdays and Thursday is Thanksgiving. So we will be taking the week off and we will be substituting an older podcast so that your feed won't be empty. And then we will return the following week as every week. And I want to thank Noah Smith for joining us. Very enlightening. I hope you'll come back. And I wish all of our listeners a very wonderful holiday. 